Hello there, everybody. I hope that you're doing okay. Welcome to my third thoughts for the day. I hope that these thoughts for the days have been useful and helpful to you. So far, we have looked at Jesus predicting the downfall of the temple. We've had a look back to Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus with the crowd shouting Hosanna. And we've also looked at a more intimate scene with Jesus being anointed with perfume by Mary. But why did all of these things happen? What is the context? What is the reason, if you like, that these things happen in this particular way? You know, I was reading once that some people believe that Jesus was the first ever Christian. I suppose it makes the logic makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus Christ, Christian. Jesus was the first Christian. Well, no, that's not the case. Jesus was a Jew. And the history of God's relationship with the Jewish people goes back thousands and thousands of years since way before the time of Jesus. And it's all in the Bible. There we go, right there. Split into the Old and the New Testaments. And actually, if I just quickly find the beginning of the New Testament, which is there, and get the Old Testament here, you get to get a sense of the size. That's the Old Testament there. And that is the New Testament. So it's much, much smaller. And actually, the pages at the end there, that's all index. So, you know, a vast amount of literature speaks about the relationship that God has with his people, with the Jews. And you know, the Old Testament is full of prophecies about the coming of Jesus. If you ever go to church at Christmas time, you will see that there are readings from the Old Testament from people like Isaiah, who speak about the coming of the one who will bring salvation to his people. And that happens around about the middle section of the Old Testament, the, uh, the prophets. But this morning I want to go even further back to the time of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, the law as it's known to the Jewish people. And I'd like to go back to the Israelite tribe, the Israelite tribe who are in Egypt. And they are under the yoke of the Egyptians. They're enslaved by the Egyptians. And God comes to those people through Moses and tells Pharaoh to let his people go. And I'm sure you all know the story. Pharaoh refuses. And then the plagues are given to the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh finally lets them go. But then changes his mind and chases after them. And the Israelite people are at the banks of the Red Sea with Moses. And Moses obeys the commands of God and uses his staff, strikes the ground, and the sea parts. And the Israelites go through onto the other side, into the promised land. The land that will be their salvation. But why did God do all of that for those people? Why did he do that for the Jews? Was he beholden to them? Did he owe them anything? Were they better than all the other peoples of the world? No, they weren't. We're going to look at our reading now. And if you have your Bibles in front of you, or if you'd like to switch them on, the reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning to read at verse 7. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 7 beginning to read at verse 7. And it says this. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. God did not choose the Israelite people because they were holy or righteous or good. He chose them because he loved them. And because he was to work his purposes out through them. His purposes of 
the salvation of the whole world from the problem of sin which we all have in us. And much of the rest of the Old Testament actually is about how Israel failed to be that those people, the people of salvation. They fail to be righteous, they fail to be good. And so often, in particular in the prophets, the prophets are sent to Israel who, to tell them to go back to being the way that they should be and stop being unjust to people, stop not looking after the homeless and the poor and the widow, as it says in the old, in the old text. But there is also something else. There's not only the rebuke. There's also a promise. A foretelling. A foretelling that one day God would act decisively and bring salvation to all people. Not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. That's everybody else. Us. All the promises of God were designed to be fulfilled in a nation in Israel. We see that in the Old Testament. They were to be the beacon on the hill, the light shining in the darkness. The light that shows the people how to be. But what happens? It doesn't go well. They fail. But with Jesus, all of the prophecies, all of, all of the ideals of Israel, all of the promised salvation that Israel was meant to be, is homed in. And it's homed in onto the person of Jesus Christ himself and he becomes the literal embodiment of Israel we all have sin we all do things we shouldn't do just as the Israelites did but Jesus the man who was without sin becomes Israel for us in its perfect form and is therefore able to do something about sin he is able to get rid of sin and we will, be, we will be looking at the fulfillment of that in a couple of days time but it's also important to get a sense of this history this centrality of the Jew, Jewish people because tomorrow when we look at the Last Supper we will see how important that history is and how Jesus reimagines the history of Israel and places it firmly onto his own shoulders but what I'd like to encourage you today is, I guess many preachers do this, but actually it's, a, it's an important thing to do. And that is, read the Old Testament. Take some time to study it and go through it. Even if you're skim reading it, read through the whole thing. If you don't know where to start, Genesis is a pretty good place. The beginning. Where better to start in a book? And there may be some bits that you don't like. There may be some bits you don't understand. There are many bits that I don't understand. But in it, you will see, if you bear with it, you will see that God is working out his purposes in the people of Israel. He is fulfilling them all through Israel and by extension through Jesus. If you read the Old Testament, you will get a sense of the overall story of salvation that God has come to bring. So I'd like to pray for us now and pray that we have a new understanding at this time of what the history of the Jewish people means for us and also in that context therefore what Jesus means to us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father thank you for the Old Testament, thank you for all of its promise and all of its history and thank you for choosing your people, the Israelites. Thank you for choosing that people through whom you decided out of your love to bring salvation to the whole world. And thank you Lord that that message of salvation, that coming of salvation is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Help us to become more aware of the history of your people to this day and how Jesus fulfills all of the prophecies in the Old Testament and how his coming and his death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday will mean the changing not just of Israel but of the entire world.
And we ask this in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great day.